Good morning. So this morning what I want to share on is uh, gospel partnerships, the unsung heroes. And it kind of was birthed when I traveled to the States uh, a couple of months back. And when we travel, we don't go to places, we go to people and our relationships that we have. And one family was Julian and Katia with Zeke and Eva. We went to see their church and their church plant and everything that they're doing in uh, one of the most expensive cities in the world in Boston and how they are thriving there. And, uh, and from there, it's so good to see my mate, uh, Julesy, but from there, then I went to Salt Lake City and I, I went to see a couple that I met 10 years ago, but we've been in, in contact and uh, it's Max and Annie and they are American, Ukrainian and I went to see them, they had just been displaced and had to go back to the States. They planted a church in Afghanistan under the banner of a CrossFit gym. Max and Anya got seven kids, and uh, they took all their kids there and uh, planted a church there. They've got a, a, a mission called uh, Frontline Missions, and uh, two, within two weeks, after two years of, of planning and establishing there, they had to then, they actually took a whole bunch of families and have positioned them in Brazil because... Uh, getting saved, becoming a Christian there is uh, life-threatening. So anyway, two weeks, they had to get out of the country um, because the Taliban were coming through, and they were displaced again. They call themselves displaced in the States. Uh, they feel comfortable in the Ukraine. They feel comfortable in Afghanistan, and uh, they have got a different kind of children. So anyway, they're my mates. We went there. We've done some mission trips together. Uh, we've just got a beautiful, fond relationship with one another. They live very, very differently to the city life uh, that um, Julian and Katia are reaching in the city and have had the dream of reaching the city. They've got a, a dream of reaching uh, displaced people in war-torn places and uh, places that are under threat because they've got the greatest desire to see souls saved. Um, so as soon as they got displaced in, back into the States. The war of Russia and Ukraine hit, and uh, Max knew his next assignment. And through his obedience and his going, uh, the borders were open, and he got in so, so much food relief into that area and the space. He said, Rich, I just go, and I allow the Lord to lead me. He's only 40 years old. I mean, they started having kids young. But uh, when I went to visit them, they had the same ingredients as Julian and Katya. The same ingredients, they live very, very differently. Uh, when I got to the airport, Max said, hey, you want to go to a hotel? You want to sleep on my couch? I said, no problem, I sleep on your couch. I want to be with you. But not knowing there was a trailer couch, it was about this big. And, uh, but anyway, I've, I've been on the mission field, we were roughing it. But just how they live, you know, two trailers right now. So they've got this, the ingredients of of grace and faith and obedience and sacrifice and generosity. But what I want to talk about today is the other ingredient in their life, and it's gospel partnerships. And I'll explain it now, what gospel patrons are. And then we're going to do some story time. Because I, I want to use every moment in my life as a teachable moment. I said, Lord, how are they actually doing what they're doing? Because I know what, how people in ministry live. And actually, it's the unsung heroes of those who have partnered with them financially. It's those who have partnered with them with homes. It's partnered with them in uprooting themselves to go and partner with them in the gospel. It's people who are at that stage of life is like, what now with my life? I've, 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 what now with all this money? What now with my business? What now with all of the things that God has allowed me to do? Because this is not the only thing that shapes history. And, uh, and we're going to see some unsung heroes with what, the, what this looks like. Because all of us have got a part to play. And so I went and searched the scriptures. I went, and, I went and looked and I said, Lord, you have to show me in the scriptures and then I want to go to the history books and I want to find out these gospel, gospel patrons. And, and this is what it means. Uh, let me read Romans 16, 1 to 5 first. 
Paul's greetings, and now sometimes we bypass all of these scriptures because Paul's greeting someone, and we, we're like, okay, I, I want to I wanna get the, to the grips of theology, but it's these people who have brought theology to our shores because of their work. And I'm just going to read about two people, but you go and read the whole of Romans 16. You'll see Paul greets those who have worked hard, those who are his kingsmen, those who have sacrificed, those who are his fellow prisoners, those, the one who, who first got saved in Asia. He's, it's so relational and so connected because this thing should never be done in isolation. We need partners and we need partnerships, but I think because we viewed the kingdom through the lens of the church and not the church through the lens of the kingdom, we found ourselves quite limited in what we can do. So what do I do? You might be a business person and you might be here and you're going, okay, oh, well, how, how can I affect the reality and change history because I'm viewing everything in the local church? Does that mean I must go, yes, we want you. Clive Howell, he serves in the, uh, the barista team. You go and research Clive Howell. So I'm just saying you can do that, but there's so much more. There's so much more to your faithful giving to a local church. There's so much more to us shaping history together, and it's gospel partnerships, which means that I can preach the gospel, or the preachers can preach, and the patrons can fund. And everybody in between, and some people can do both. They make money and they can preach. But the reality is, for the end time reality and harvest to come, everybody has to play their part. And I today am going to invite you into that space. And we've got some people that are leaving and we've got some people that are relocating. I'm, uh, if I can plant the seed today that you can relocate, then, then actually somebody else benefits from you relocating. It's not, yes, your holiday home, but can you fill it with people? Yes, your table, but you can fill it with food. For the up and outs and the down and outs, what can your life do for the sake of the kingdom? Next, next slide, please. Gospel patron. People who resource and come alongside others to help them proclaim the gospel. And I've met those people with Julian Katia's life, and they're unsung heroes. They don't want to be known. But they've got the same focus as Julian and Katia do when it comes to Jesus and his kingdom. We've got movements helping Max now because they're like, we better help that guy because there's favor on him to open up nations. Young guy, he looks like a, an asset, man. You meet him in the street, you think this guy is getting paid by the U.S. government. But he, God shapes certain people for certain things. What's our part? All of our part. So don't get distracted if I speak about the preachers and the patrons, and you're like, oh, that's not me, I'm in between. No, no, every person in the Bible's got a, a place and a space and a part to play. So let's enjoy the scriptures together, and then I'm gonna read quite a lot, and you can sit back and close your eyes and try and imagine the story, because some of the history that I'm bringing you is snippets, not the full detail. This, yeah, this moment is for you to go, oh, I want to go and study that because I feel there's something on that for me and for my family. What about Mary and Joseph? How did they actually do what they did? How did they travel? How did they move from one place to another? Yeah, God brought them three wise rich men. They could do what they do. You look at Luke 8, I find three women, Mary, Joanna, and Susanna, who actually took hold of Jesus and the disciples, and from their means served the disciples and Jesus. Three ladies. In the book of Acts, we find this beautiful couple. Did I read that scripture? Didn't I? See, I just went ahead. Let's read that scripture. Go back. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, and a servant of the church of Centuria, that you may welcome her in the Lord and in a, a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need, for she has been a patron of many and myself as well. Greet Prisca or Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentile give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house, Greet my beloved, my beloved friend who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Now, Phoebe 
and Priscilla and Aquila were there as support roles, but as well ministered the gospel. Let me read something to you about them. A married couple in the early church who were business people, but they did not stop them from engaging in God's business to advance the gospel. They hosted a church in their house. They came alongside a well-known preacher, and you can see this in Acts 18, named Apollos. Now, Apollos was a brilliant preacher. Paul fumbled over his words, like some of us up here. But Apollos, he was sharp, he was clean, he didn't miss a word. But Priscilla and Aquila were sitting at the back there, and they were listening to him as he ministered, and they thought to himself, man, this guy needs to know the gospel a little bit better than he does, because it says he only knew about the baptism of John, but he was a sharp, sharp preacher, and he could preach. The, Priscilla and Aquila, they'd been displaced from Rome, got kicked out of Rome. they in this area, in Corinth, and they bring him into their home around the table in a beautiful way, and they help him with his theology. And the book of Acts says this, after he had learned from them, he asked the apostles if he could go and preach in another place. And they were like, go for it. And it says this, and he preached and he encouraged those who were saved by grace, and he refuted the Jews, and he told them that Jesus was the Christ. It was a phenomenal thing. So it doesn't stop at you writing a check or sending money. It's you being theologically brilliant at the same time. This is who Paul had. Now, they, their theology was going to change because they hung around with Paul. But what happened is they kept something in their heart captured the kingdom, and they moved two or three times for the sake of the church and for the sake of the kingdom. At the end of it, they were back in Rome, and Paul then mentions them in Rome. He says, listen, this is not only for me, but it's for so many. And they planted another church in their house that Paul would come and encourage. So they uprooted themselves for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the kingdom. There's another guy we, we probably wouldn't have heard about Priscilla and Aquila if we don't thank Theophilus. Now who's Theophilus? Theophilus is a guy who funded Luke in writing the book of Luke and writing the book of Acts. Oh, amazing Theophilus, it says, in the book of Acts. Did Theophilus know that he was going to actually have two letters based because he was so hungry for Jesus? He didn't know that was going to be in the canon of Scripture. Theophilus. Then we get Phoebe, who used her home to host missionaries as well as the church in her city. She even assisted the Apostle Paul and many others with financial needs. Phoebe, Phoebe's greatest ministry responsibility was to hand carry Paul's letters to the Christians in Rome. For this reason, Paul described her with the title of patron. Welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. So there's a couple from Scripture, but I want to bring some from history, from the 1500s to the 1800s. These unsung heroes who might be sitting in the pews today that shape the next generation and shape the generation beyond. We're sitting here because of what these people risk their necks to do for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the kingdom. You might have heard of William Tyndall, but have you heard of Humphrey Mon Monmouth? You might have heard of George Whitfield, but have you heard of Lady Huntington? You might have heard of John Newton, who penned Amazing Grace, but have you heard of John Thornton? So these are the couple of things I'm going to do, and I've called it story time, so I'm going to read and I'm going to pull out a little bit and allow you to absorb a little bit of history this morning, which is a little bit different to what I usually do. You know, I've got a statement here. It says, sometimes we need to read history so that we don't repeat it. Other times we need to read it so that we do. So let's go. William Tyndall and Humphrey Monmouth in 1523 when this relationship started. William Tyndall was a preacher and a Bible translator, and Humphrey Monmouth was a businessman. He was a cloth merchant, and he owned many ships. Tyndall's desire at that time, as he was preaching, was to get the Bible into the common man's hand 
because it was only written in Latin, and the Catholic Church owned everything, and they said, if you try and change it from Latin to English, you will be burnt at the stake. Tyndall said this, from Oxford to London, from the country chapels to city churches, I have seen that men are ignorant of God's word. Tyndall explained that Latin stifles the faith of our land. Most people know only a few words of it, including the priests. Those who do, they use it as a power play to stop God's grace and fatten their pocketbooks. With a Bible in the language of the people translated from the original Greek, we could steer our whole nation back to Christianity's true core, faith alone in Christ Jesus. Monmouth asked him this question. But what about the Pope and the Constitution prohibiting Bible translation? You could be burnt as a heretic. I defy the Pope and all his laws, Tyndall said. If God spares my life for many years, I will cause a boy that drives a plow to know more of the Scriptures than the Pope does. Then the partnership began. Sharing around a table, eating a meal, one man's vision and one man's desire to pave a way, another man catches a vision to pay the way. German Martin Luther at that time was transcribing all his letters and the Bible from Latin into German. The same time what God put on Tyndall's heart, he had put on Martin Luther's heart. And these guys met at one stage. It was around... Humphrey Monmouth's table that the future of the English New Testament unfolded. In 1524, Tyndall went to Germany because his life was in danger to translate the Bible into English where Luther advised him and helped him. In 1526, two years later, 3,000 New Testaments were ready for shipping and Tyndall's life was now extremely in danger. Tyndall again, he needed Monmouth and the other merchants that he met. But this time he need them, needed them to become smugglers. The merchants took these 3,000 volumes and tucked them away secretly in marked crates and hid them in bundles of cloth. Others carefully buried the Bibles in sacks of flour. Still others sealed Tyndall's Bibles in watertight boxes and dropped them in barrels of wine or oil. Some built wooden chests with false sides or secret compartments to perfectly conceal the pocket-sized books. The owners of the forbidden Bibles then were inviting groups of people to meet secretly in their homes so that they could listen to God's word read aloud in English. This Bible lit the fuse of the English Reformation. Monmouth in 1528 1528 was arrested on 24 counts, including smuggling Luther's books, aiding Tyndall's translation of the English New Testament, helping the New Testament be printed and brought into England, believing that a Christian man should worship God only and not saints, affirming that salvation is by faith alone, not by any words. And Monmouth spent a year in prison. But he was a shrewd man, he was a clever man, and he got himself out of prison because so many of the people that that were in the city worked for him and the economy started to drop. So the city guys got him out of prison after a year. But in 1536, many years later, Tyndall was strangled up against a wooden post by an executioner and burnt at the very stake for defending the gospel of justification by faith. His last shout was this, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. When Monmouth heard the news, he whispered to himself, William, we did it. England will never be the same. What the partnership between Monmouth and Tyndall launched was nothing less than a reformation. Within two years, God answered Tyndall's prayer. The king of England's eyes were opened. I think I've just read this too many times. I'm getting it now. In 1538, he ordered that every parish church should receive its own copy of the English Bible. The plow boy got his scripture. And so did the other six million Englishmen. Today there are more than 600 million English speakers who directly benefited from William Tyndale's life and work. You see, history remembers Tyndale, but it's largely forgotten that behind this massive movement of God 
was a businessman. In the shadows of the English Reformation stands an invaluable gospel patron named Humphrey Monmouth. Let's talk about George Whitfield and Lady Huntington. Was a young preacher. He started preaching at 21. What's your guy's excuse? And a wealthy real estate owner. England had forgotten about God 200 years since Tyndale. And this is how the 18th century began. But by God's grace, this is not how it was going to end. In his mercy, God united a passionate preacher and a single-minded patroness to spread the gospel far and wide. Their two minds met for the single purpose. Their two paths joined to make a wide road. The turning points of their lives became the turning point in a revival that woke up a nation to God. And this is Lady Huntington. She was a woman who was a tornado and a silver spoon wrapped into one, 5.6 inches force of nature and an heiress of old money, blunt, opinionated, constantly in motion. Lady Huntington was a rare English aristocrat. She rubbed shoulders with royalty, enjoyed a pinch of snuff, and most definitely believed the Bible. Paining for the state of her nation, she prayed. But Lord, what am I to do about it? She didn't ask, what are the preachers doing? She asked this question, what am I going to do about it? My generation lies lost in darkness. They're like sheep without a shepherd. May God, may you pour your abundant blessings upon our sinful country and help me to fill my place in your work. George Whitfield, he was thunder and he was lightning, a man made to awaken the slumbering. He spoke in a way that showed spiritual things to be real. He was biblical, he was passionate, dramatic, and joyful. He loved the people he preached to, frequently wept in his sermons, and urgently pleaded with everyone to come to Jesus. Whitfield's maxim was this, to preach as a palace painted for eternity. He often preached twice a day, seven days a week, sometimes more. The crowds who came to hear him were so large that pioneered something no other Englishman had tried. He preached outside. Many who never entered the church came to hear him in the fields, the parks, the hillsides, and even the fairs. When Whitfield came to town, mechanics closed their shops and construction workers left their job sites to hear him. When he preached at 5 a.m., he had a packed house. When his sermons lasted two hours, people stayed awake, even after 20 minutes. But that's where this partnership began. Lady Huntington, who was a friend of Benjamin Franklin. She said to Whitfield, I have a burden for the influential in England. They won't go outside the fields to hear the Methodist preachers, and when they attend church, they hear sermons with no theological guts. Whitfield, I want you to bring the gospel to them in my home tonight. Whitfield made it plain to the crowd that night, My only aim is to bring you to Christ, to deliver to you from your false confidences, to raise you from your dead formality, and to revive real Christianity. He wasn't there to make friends. Though Whitfield was in the presence of society's greats, he held nothing back. May I reach the influential and the mob, he said. And I think of Ian Gawley, whose vision from God for harvest was to reach the up and outs, and the down and outs. Why not Jesus? Lady Huntington made that possible with her wealth and her nobility. There were people that offered Whitfield lots of money to stay, to preach in England, to preach in Boston, to preach in Philadelphia, to preach in Maryland. But Whitfield said, the sight of so many perishing souls every day affects me much and makes me long to go, if possible, from pole to pole to proclaim redeeming love. Lady Huntington's patronage made it possible for Whitfield to fulfill his dream. Lady Huntington, when Whitfield left, started preaching herself. It started one day when she went to visit someone next to a bakery, and as she was ministering and opened up her Bible and did a Bible study, there was a crack in the wall, and all the people that came to get their bread started to hear the Word of God. That little Bible study became a church plant in Brighton because it grew so quickly. It says this. By 50, Lady Huntington had lost her husband and five of her seven children, but she had Jesus for the nations in her gaze. She started building chapels and churches. 
Why build a chapel, they questioned. Your money could be better spent on helping the poor. I do pity the poor, she answered, and I will give them what I can. But when I gave myself up to the Lord, I likewise devoted all my fortune to him with this condition, that I would take with a sparing hand what might be necessary for my food, clothing, and support of my children. But few, even among professing Christians, have a proper concern for the awful condition of perishing souls. With this concern for perishing souls, Lady Huntington built herself a chapel in a style that would make the aristocrat residents of Bath comfortable to enter. (laughs) Opening day was a rainy gray one, but the still curious crowds of Bath found their way to the chapel. chapel. Whitfield, who was now 50, ascended to the pulpit to preach to a packed house. The need was for more chapels everywhere. Whitfield worked to raise up more preachers while Lady Huntington labored to provide places for them to worship. With her help, within a few years, she was responsible for 116 preaching places and a learning place to train more preachers. Whitfield preached 18,000 sermons, averaging more than 10 a week, more than 500 a year for 34 consecutive years. His body was tired at 50, and he went to be with Jesus after his last message. In total, Whitfield evangelized upward of 10 million people, and no one could begin to count the number of conversions that he saw. Together, this gospel preacher and this gospel patron brought their generation face to face with eternity and revived the faith of the English-speaking world. What about John Newton? and a man that you might not have heard of, John Thornton. A preacher and an author, and the wealthiest businessman in England. John Newton penned Amazing Grace, 500 papers, and many hymn books. John Thornton was a trade merchant. Religion was kept in its official place, all dressed up outwardly to impress, but the salt had lost its saltiness. The Church of England, like a tired old man, seemed ready to lay down and give up the ghost. It was up to the next generation to spread God's movement among the church. And this work began with a former slave trade and an uneducated merchant, both named John. A copy of Newton's autobiography found Thornton. And Thornton thought to himself, I haven't met a gospel preacher yet. This guy seems true. Rode his horse and he met him. Over the next few years, these two Johns formed an unusual friendship exchanging hundreds of letters to one another. Their letters were honest and unguarded. The men shared prayer and confessed sin to one another. They wrote about their doctrine, how to help the poor and the condition of their nation. They spurred one another on. In 18th century England, wealthy people controlled the church pulpits, not under Thornton's watch. All of those that were owned, he purchased and he, pre- and he put in them gospel preaching preachers. He was the wealthiest man in England at the time, but he kept his life in check with Newton. He wrote a letter and he said, I've been indulging this morning in meditation and prayer, and I was glad to remain quiet until noon to devote a few hours to the remembrance of Proverbs 10, 22, the blessing, the blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow to it, which I can put an amen to, he said. You will, dare I say, help us with your prayers. May the Lord keep every one of us looking with single eye to him that we may not disgrace our holy profession. Newton kept him grounded. How worthless, Newton says, will money be found by those who overvalue it now. In the hour of death and the day of judgment, the hour is coming where everything else will appear trifling and vain, but not so the knowledge and the service of Jesus. In 1779, Newton's hymns were printed and Thornton's investment in the first thousand copies propelled it to become the bestseller. This caught the attention of the bookstore owners who promptly stocked it. Within a year, the hymn book went through five editions and showed no signs of stopping, the most famous of all, as we sang and will sing again, Amazing Grace. With Thornton's help, Newton also led one of the most influential churches in England. They preached In churches, they preached in homes. They preached in business offices. They preached 
in factories. Men like Thornton set the table while Newton set forth the gospel. And there was young, one young man who was a politician at the time who sought an audience with Newton, and his name was William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce was one of the main agents in abolishing the slave trade. But he has such an interesting story how God puts two, three people together. When Newton got off the slave trade, uh, off, off, off the ships, he only wanted to do one thing, because that's where he wrote Amazing Grace, who saved a wretch like me. He thought to himself, the only thing I'm going to do is clean the church floor. And that's where God started speaking to him. And what he used to do is he used to gather about 200 little pickies, man, running around the streets of London at that time and all that place. And he used to gather them because no one else could capture these, their attention. They were poor. They were uneducated. He gathered them in the church, and he used to minister to them through stories, biblical stories, and through his own life. And these little kids were gripped with his stories. One of those little kiddies was William Wilberforce, who gave his life to Jesus. Whew. William Wilberforce's uncle was John Thornton. Now, how God all just comes and ties all these things together to shape a nation at a time that needed it. He wanted the audience with Newton to say, what shall I do? You're raising up these preachers. And then Newton and Thornton's wisdom said, no. You can have influence where few preachers can have influence, and that's in politics. And he fought for it, and while Thornton was supplying the needs of the gospel, he was supplying the needs of William Wilberforce to go after what he needed to go after in politics. You had a businessman, you had a pastor, and you had a politician. Imagine what our country would look like if we had those three, two, three people together with conviction to see our nation shaped through Christ and His kingdom. What would that look like? What about this generation? They shaped a generation and they brought the gospel to England again. It was said of, Newton said this of Thornton's generosity for him, giving is like breathing. If he stops, he will die. For Thornton, Newton, and Wilberforce, the gospel was fundamental. Thornton loved to accelerate the ministries of the men who preached the gospel. Newton played the part of patriarch in England's future church leaders, missionaries, and laymen. Wilberforce wrote the best-selling book on Christian doctrine that he called My Manifesto, and he ended slavery. These men believe the foundation of justice, the engine of activism, the catalyst of change is not politics or morality, not votes or campaigns, but a return to faith in Jesus. More than anything, these men were gospel men. History remembers the names of Newton and Wilberforce, but unknown to us most is that of Thornton. This is a strange one because he was so well known in his own day. When he died, the media hailed his passing, claiming that Thornton's charities transcended belief and reached to the remotest parts of the globe. Sometimes we need to read history so that we get to repeat it. I think we're in a day and an age where we've seen all the mess when it comes to preachers and money and money and preachers. But if we see the kingdom rightly, we can have kingdom partnerships that shape neighborhoods, that shape nations, that shape our city, shape the nation. It takes people who go, how do I fit in the kingdom? You go and read the scriptures that there's a role for every single person. Today I might be mentioning those who have partnered with preachers that shape history, but what about every single person in between? But history, if we don't learn from it, we'll be worse off for it. I've seen the corruption when it comes to rich people trying to own pastors and churches. I've seen pastors and churches try and manipulate people and control them with their finances. We're not going to do that. We want to shape history together because there's not enough time for us to shape things and bring things the young men and women in this house, what do you want to do if there's great favor over your businesses one day? Who do you want to be? 
You want to be an unsung hero? If it's to preach, then you must preach. If it's to give, then you must give. If it's to administrate, then you must administrate. Go and read it in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. There's gifts that hold this church together, that hold the kingdom together, that hold churches together. And you know what they were really passionate about? Seeing people come to Jesus. Seeing people enter into Christ like we were seeing, seeing themselves as He sees us, and seeing ourselves rightly in the word that Kev brought, that we can see ourselves as new creations, with one Father and one Lord. John Piper, he says this. Please put up that slide. People who make a difference in this world are not people who have mastered a lot of things. They are people who have been mastered by a very few things that are very, very great. If you want your life to count, you don't have to have a high IQ, don't have to have a high EQ, don't have to be smart, don't have to have good looks, don't have to be from a good family or a good school. You just have to know a few basic, simple, glorious, majestic, obvious, unchanging, eternal things and be gripped by them and be willing to lay down your life for them. Which is why anybody in this crowd can make a worldwide wide difference because it isn't you, it's what you're gripped with. What's gripping you? Can we come up, um, Gibbs? And we're going to sing Amazing Grace again in honor not only of the man who penned it, but in honor of the man who funded it. Because we wouldn't be able to sing it if it didn't get funded and printed and released. There's so many things that history can tell us that we're so grateful for. We don't live in the dark ages because men and women set a path paved the way, and others paid away. John Newton says this in my conclusion. Surely there is nothing worth living, living for but to be instrumental in promoting his service. So what we're going to do is we're going to sing Amazing Grace. You're going to connect with Jesus. Then we're going to pray, and then we're going to go out with a challenge. Amen? Amen. So let's stand together so we can sing it together. Set free, my 
God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a blood, His mercy brings unending love, amazing grace. Lord has promised. Shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbid to shine. But God, who 